Good morning to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you again and particularly appreciate the chance to talk with you about alcohol uh, use uh, disorders. This continues to be a, a dominant drug of abuse in our culture. Um, it's a core area of addiction medicine and I think of primary care as well. And also because I think uh, working and struggling with patients uh, who are dealing with alcohol use disorders is a particularly stimulating and particularly uh, potentially rewarding aspect of addiction medicine. You know, obviously we have some medicines that help uh, and that's part of our role, but this is one of those areas of addiction medicine where a lot of it is about just talking to people, about getting down in the weeds, helping them to sort things out, helping them motivate and advising, and struggling with them sometimes, not being really clear with what the appropriate direction is, but trying to figure out what's gonna help this particular person for their particular uh, problem with alcohol. My objectives uh, in that regard are to define alcohol use disorders as a spectrum of behaviors, outline the uh, diagnostic uh, strategies we can use to identify where people are on that spectrum, provide an overview of goals and methods for intervening, describe motivationally oriented responses to someone uh, on, who is struggling with alcohol, and in particular, to spend some time talking about dealing with folks with moderate to severe uh, alcohol uh, use, and outline the current evidence related to approaches to moderation management, including the potential role of medications. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, we want to be able to answer this question, when is it appropriate to return to moderate drinking and how do we assist folks that uh, want to do that? You know, there's an old saying in, in AA uh, that once you're a pickle, you can't go back to being a cucumber. And Jane, who spoke with you yesterday, describes sitting in her office with a patient sitting on the couch crying, I don't want to be a pickle. I don't want to be a pickle. So the question, of course, is when has someone become a pickle? And um, how do you figure that out? And how do you deal with that clinically? And how do you help them, the patient themselves, figure it out? I'm going to go straight to what I consider the, the, the core conceptual slide in the presentation. This is a schema that was given broad uh, dissemination in a 1990 book called Broadening the Base of Treatment for Alcohol Problems. It was an Institute of Medicine initiative chaired by Fred Glazer. Uh, many of you may know Fred uh, was uh, an important supporter of the Governor's Institute early on and is the namesake for the Glazer Award that the Institute uh, gives out uh, intermittently. And um, this uh, was really a very important uh, uh, concept uh, that helped to shift the field of substance use disorders, alcohol use disorders in particular, uh, uh, into thinking of this more as a continuum uh, rather than just focusing on finding alcoholics and intervening with them, recognizing that substance use disorders, alcohol use disorders in this case, typically uh, exist a lot, present in populations along the continuum from moderate, uh, low risk to at risk or uh, uh, problematic use, and then gradually progressing into uh, use disorders of increasing severity uh, up to uh, what used to be called alcoholism or severe uh, alcohol use disorder. Uh, the, the statistics, the numbers come from NIAAA, a variety of their, their uh, epidemiological studies, and point out that in the United States, uh, about a third of adults do not drink which is uh, a surprising uh, statistic for a lot of our patients. It would be a surprising, would have been a surprising statistic for um, a young Brett Kavanaugh, that very few, that a third of people don't drink and another third drink moderately uh, without significant risk or problems. So two thirds of folks uh, are, are really not a concern about their drinking. On the other hand, there's a significant cohort, 28% or so that drink at risk, abuse, about uh, half of those would end up being given an alcohol use diagnosis, and a small percentage of them would be diagnosed as alcoholic or, or severe alcohol uh, disorder. A couple of things that are important about uh, this uh, construct is um, that the major morbidity and mortality in this country comes not from alcoholics, but from these at-risk and problem drinkers. And so uh, the CDC stats are that of the 90,000 uh, deaths in this country yearly from alcohol-related causes, 
about 56%, a majority of them are from acute effects of things like binge drinking and acute impairment. And the rest are from more accumulative effects. And the other thing that's really uh, important about this particular uh, slide is this idea that intervention should match the level of, of problem that the person is having. Um, a couple of caveats about, about this slide. Uh, it, although there are nice uh, firm black lines between these categories, those black lines are not there. They're very fuzzy. Uh, sometimes it's, it's easy, sometimes it's not so easy to tell which category the person is in. And the other thing to be careful about with this is it sort of implies an inevitable progression to this process, and that's not necessarily the case. It is the case for some, obviously, but there are a lot of people who move back and forth along this continuum, sometimes with intervention, sometimes on their, on their own. Now, one of the challenges of using this, this construct is there's a lot of terminology involved, and there can be uh, a lot of uh, vagueness about this sometime, not just among clinicians and, and the public, but in the literature. So it makes interpreting the, the literature on alcohol use disorders and their, their interventions somewhat confusing at times because folks aren't always clear about what kind of drinker or what kind of alcohol use they're talking about. So a whole range of terms that we wanna clarify as we go through this presentation. So for example, heavy or at-risk drinking was defined by the World Health Organization as a pattern or level of substance use that's associated with increased development of adverse physical, psychological, or social consequences. It's clinically defined uh, by amount, frequency, impairment-related uh, issues. There's cumulative risk over, over time, and there's acute risk, as I said a moment ago, from impairment and injury. Um, and so one of the definitions that typically is used is a heavy drinking episode or binge is usually thought to be uh, a level of drinking or a pattern of drinking that results in significant impairment. So for example, an average sized man drinking five or more drinks over a relatively short period of time, a woman drinking uh, uh, four or more drinks over a short period of time will end up with a significant impairment such as a 0.08 blood level. Uh, and a heavy drinker or heavy drinking is generally defined in the literature as uh, someone who drinks in this way frequently, for example, over five times a month. Now, of course, a lot of our patients would uh, look at these stats and say, what, five drinks? You call that a binge? That's just getting started. Okay. So the other data that we look at uh, is this issue of cumulative effect from ongoing drinking over time. And so epidemiological studies that look at the average intake and its effect on health uh, show a pretty consistent pattern. And this is the one on, uh, on uh, uh, heart disease that many of you have probably seen, the so-called J-curve, that uh, demonstrates that there seems to be a sweet spot in some ways in terms of in terms of health where drinking one or two drinks a day has actually some, seems to have some potential advantages in terms of health. Whereas as you go up from that to three, four, five drinks a day or more on average, you uh, really start seeing an escalation in the risk of cumulative, negative cumulative effects. And this is for uh, congestive heart disease, but there are similar uh, data for a variety of all causes and suicide and other uh, problems. So there's an old joke. How does a doctor decide if their patient is drinking too much? Well, the answer is if they drink more than their doctor, or at least that's the answer in the, in the joke. The answer from the, from the NIAAA looked at these uh, risk curves was that men who drink over 14 drinks a week or men who drink over five, four drinks per occasion and women or men uh, uh, over 65, you dial those down to seven and three. And of course, men or women who drink in high risk situations are all considered to be at risk drinkers. What do we mean by a drink? You would think we wouldn't have to define that, that that would seem to be pretty obvious, but it's not always obvious. We know, we've all seen this, this um, similar uh, graphic to this, that you know, one of the nice things about the alcohol uh, uh, beverage industry is they managed to come up with unit-based dosing. So there's an equivalency between the average beer, the average glass of wine, and the average mixed drink. Uh, 
Um, and so that makes it possible for someone who knows their tolerance, knows their, their, uh, what it takes to get a buzz, what it takes to, to maintain, knows that they can, they can substitute as necessary. Um, and, um, but you know, it's worth commenting that this isn't always obvious. You know, a lot of people don't measure. It's not uncommon to ask somebody, so how much do you drink? Well, I have two or three drinks. Well, what's a drink? Oh, it's about this much. And they'll show themselves pouring a certain amount into a glass. It's also not always obvious in terms of the uh, things like beers come in different concentrations. There are drinks, uh, these ice drinks uh, that you get uh, in uh, convenience stores that often have a, a very heavy alcohol content. And so it's important, again, as we start talking about assessment, it's gonna be important that you really get specific about this in terms of how much is the person drinking. And sometimes it, it, it's, to be frank, it's hard for the person to clearly tell you. I remember doing an intervention with a woman that talked about, you know, well, how many drinks? And she said, well, you know, I put a little vodka and I put orange juice. Well, how much? Well, it depends on the time of day. And I finally had to just say, well, okay, you buy half gallons. How long does it take you to go through a half gallon? She said about a week. So you, sometimes it really is hard uh, to assess and you really have to be persistent if you really want to uh, get the data you need. And particularly if we're talking about this idea of ultimately going to talk about who's uh, a reasonable candidate for moderation. Uh, problem use or abuse, again, seems pretty straightforward. Somebody that's having problems related to their alcohol. And those problems can be in multiple domains of their life. Um, sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's pretty subtle, especially if you're talking about emotional or interpersonal or cognitive problems. Often you need another source of information. You need to get the wife or the parent uh, or the uh, husband in uh, and to get another perspective. Sometimes the person don't, doesn't realize the degree to which they are having these sort of interpersonal or cognitive or emotional uh, relationships with alcohol until they stop. And I think many of you have probably had that experience with folks either with alcohol or with, with cannabis, but it's not until they stop using that they realize how impaired or how much it was interfering. There's this tendency to think, oh, I'm, I'm having arguments with my, with my wife all the time because she's such a pain in the butt, or I'm, uh, I'm uh, 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 emotionally up and down because my life is really stressful. And indeed, it has more to do with the person's alcohol intake rather than these external factors. So, you know, the, the way I would frame that uh, in terms of our metaphor, it's hard to know you're a pickle when you're pickled. And sometimes you got to unpickle a little bit to get a clear view. Now, uh, for some people, this progresses on to substance use disorder. And I think it's worth commenting for a few minutes because, again, this can be less than clear when you're looking at the literature in terms of are they using uh, uh, DSM-4 criteria, DSM-5 criteria, no particular criteria, et cetera. So with the DSM-5, uh, we've moved into this mild, moderate, and severe categorization, which I think is very useful. I think it's one of the better developments in this whole nomenclature that we've had in a while. And that depending on how many positives you have on the criteria, it gives you some idea uh, about how severe your problem is. Uh, I think it works in general. A few, few caveats is it can be quite variable. A person, can, one, a person saying uh, uh, wanting to cut down but unable uh, may be different from person to person. Recurrent situations or problems may be very quite variable in terms of mild to severe. And so simply checking off one of these boxes doesn't necessarily give you an idea of just how severe the person's disorder is until you actually get into some of the specifics. So we've got this slippery slope progression for a lot of folks. We've got this progression from volitional or intermittent use to regular or habitual use. Uh, we've got uh, a movement on into compulsive use in spite of ongoing problems. And finally, uh, the out of control or, or addictive use that we think about. Um, as being severe uh, alcohol use disorder. Again, it can be variable, it can go back and forth, but the further along you get on this slope, the less likely you are to be able to go back safely, to be able to moderate. The more risks, the less likely to moderate. So if it's um, 
not only a pattern, but also you've got a positive family history, you've got mental health comorbidity, you've got poor social support. Uh, all of those things can mitigate the person's ability to go back along this slope to less problematic use. Uh, just again, this comment that it's not always progressive. Um, you know, a lot of DSM-4 diagnosis of alcohol dependence occurs in relatively young adults, as uh, Dr. Grant said, uh, I believe it was yesterday, and many of those have aged out of that by, by young adulthood. Um, nonetheless, a number of folks that uh, problematic uh, use in adolescence is just the beginning of this uh, slow course for some people. Outcome of alcohol kills millions of brain cells that never killed the ones that make me want to drink. I think we've had some great demonstration or explanations of that from the other participant, the other presenters. So we've got this, this progression for a lot of people, and we've got this, this slippery slope for a lot of people. But so how do people respond to that? And uh, we know that some folks are just oblivious to that progression and don't really notice until it really slaps them in the face or they hit bottom. Uh, but there are many who respond to that. They respond to that by changing their pattern of drinking uh, on their own. So this is an interesting uh, study that looked at a NISARC sample. That's the uh, NIAAA epidemiologic sample uh, and looked at over 4,000 adults who had had a prior to past year diagnosis of alcohol dependence, that is, uh, they, in their past, in their history, they had a history of alcohol dependence, and then they were evaluated with a formalized interview process on what their past year status was in relation to drinking. 25% of them were still would have still been classified as dependent, 27% as being impartial at remission, so up to half of them were either still dependent or still drinking in a problematic way. About 12% were quote unquote, asymptomatic. They weren't having problems, but their patterns showed that they would have potentially some risk. 18% were qualified as low risk drinkers, uh, also labeled, labeled as non-abstinent recovery. So about 18% had, had uh, gone back to uh, a low risk style of drinking, and 18% had actually gone on to abstain. So 35% were either abstaining or we're drinking in a non-problematic, low-risk way. And the, the wonderful thing about this, this review is only 25% of those people had had any kind of treatment. They hadn't gone to an AA meeting, they hadn't gone to a counselor, they hadn't gone into rehab. They simply figured this out on their own and through self-management changed. Now, obviously, we don't know exactly how firm these numbers are, but they give a real uh, indication that there is this thing uh, that we can label partial recover or natural recovery. It also gave us some ideas about um, um, what are some of the so things associated with uh, likelihood of success. So being married was associated positively, uh, ethanol intake, how much the person drank before uh, deciding to change had a negative effect. Um, and uh, the more severe the, the uh, addiction, the alcohol dependence was, the more likely the person was to say, you know, I just got to, I got to stop drinking, period. Uh, Linda Sobel in the 90s uh, published a similar uh, set of data. Uh, and this is a little bit uh, 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 confusing in some ways. But if you look at the top, you notice that on these two, both of these uh, surveys, uh, most of the people did not get any kind of treatment. So what we see below is people that without treatment, what did they do in terms of changing their behavior? Uh, the thing that's a little confusing is the abstinence slide uh, represents that uh, the, the pie graph is how people uh, went to abstinence and that the majority of them did it without treatment. It actually represents about uh, two thirds of the total. So it's 300 people out of 400 and some. Uh, so about two thirds uh, 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 went to abstinence. Uh, the large majority of them did it on their own. But the people, the, the relatively smaller number, but still significant, one third, 144 or 40, 46 on the, the left hand side, uh, uh, went to non abstinence. And almost all of them made it. Uh, made that decision on their own and actualized it on their own. 
and they're, you know, they're, again, there there are a lot of sort of questions about all of this stuff in terms of, uh, you know, how did they get the diagnosis of alcohol dependence? How severe was that to begin with, et cetera? But it's still another interesting uh, uh, slice of this idea of uh, a natural uh, recovery process. So let's let's uh, shift into thinking about what our uh, therapeutic goals would be in working with uh, folks with these who are on this continuum somewhere. Uh, obviously, we want to prevent the development or onset of problems, reduce at-risk use to lower risk levels, intervene with early problematic use and prevent progression, provide treatment for severe use disorder, and with this uh, uh, and enter the idea that that could be abstinent remission or it could be non-abstinent remission defined as drinking within the lower risk limits and having no evidence or criteria for alcohol use disorder. And that would fit under a broader uh, public health goal of harm reduction that we consider any reduction in number of heavy drinking days, particularly if it's associated with significant reductions in alcohol-related problems as a, as a positive outcome. A few comments on, on screening and getting this process going. The important thing for me on this, on this slide is the transition statement. Uh, the idea that if you're asking people about their drinking, that uh, if you can establish a collaborative buy-in by relating the questions to the person's presenting problem. This is you know, true if you're, when I was in primary care, when I was a family doc, I could say to the person, while well, you're here about your depression, you know, one thing that really can affect mood is alcohol. Let me ask you some questions about your drinking. You're here for your hypertension, same lead-in. You're here for your diabetes, same lead-in. Lead um, even a well check, a wellness check, you know, one of the risks that really can have an effect on people's health in the long run is how much they drink. Let me ask you a few quick questions about your drinking. Again, it's, it's trying to set this collaborative, I'm here to help you decide whether this, what you want to do about this is really a, a useful framework. In terms of further assessment, there are instruments, there's the role of lab and, and, and other information. Um, but the bottom line, I think, as we try and sort this stuff out is let's talk about your drinking. Let's figure out where we think you are on the continuum. And I'll spend you know 10 seconds just describing this continuum from low risk use to problematic or high risk use on into real serious problems and ask the person, let's figure out where you are on that continuum. I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions. You're going to provide some information, and let's see if we can reach a, a conclusion on that. Uh, there's a good instrument, I think, if, if you want one instrument to kind of refer to either as a, as a, a somewhat more in-depth assessment or just as a prompt to you on what kind of questions to ask as you're assessing, whereas the person on the continuum, the audit has three quantity, very uh, black and white, straightforward quantity frequency questions. It also has questions related to alcohol-related problems and signs of dependency. And if you haven't ever read through it, take a few minutes uh, uh, during a break or whatnot to look at these questions. I think a useful way to, to make that real is as you're reading those questions, have somebody in mind, a family member, a person you've been concerned about, maybe about your own drinking, just to say, okay, well, where would my wife fit on this? Where would my husband fit on this? Where would I fit on this? And uh, it's, it's a useful tool, I think, you, you would find if you go through it. Okay, so uh, doing some screening, doing some assessment, we start coming up with a working uh, uh, assumption about where the person is uh, on, on this continuum. This is also from Broadening the Basic Treatment. It's uh, the, the document that sort of brought this idea to the fore that we try and figure out where people are in the continuum and we try and target the intervention uh, to that. Uh, I loved Dr. Grant's comment the other day, we need to think about substance use disorders uh, uh, like we're staging for cancer, you need to stage them like we do cancer, and this is kind of in that category. So low risk drinkers and non-drinkers, um, again, if you're in primary care, this is mostly what you're going to see. If you're doing a, a good job of screening and assessing, you're mostly going to find low-risk drinkers and non-drinkers. And you might think, well, okay, don't have to do anything about that. But no, that's, that's your, a great opportunity for anticipatory guidance, for opening the door to patients and family members to come back in if they have concerns, and give them some idea of warning signs. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of the brief intervention studies showed that a lot of people change their drinking 
just by being asked the questions that gave them some cues to think about in terms of what might be problematic. We know there's a, a, a robust uh, 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 literature now on um, at risk or, or, or brief intervention for at risk or early problem users that tend, these have tend to look at uh, people uh, early in the, or, or farther back on the continuum. Uh, they are at risk drinkers who typically have not experienced serious problems. Uh, they, uh, the interventions are frequently very brief uh, and are either one or a, a brief series of, of interactions. And meta-analyses over uh, multiple, multiple studies have shown significant uh, impact on people's drinking behavior, up to 10 to 30 percent reductions with fewer hospitalizations and ER visits. That came from a study from uh, Dr. Mike Fleming, who was at UNC years ago. And um, other uh, uh, studies and reviews that have shown, for example, in this case, as little as 15 minutes of initial contact and one follow-up, participants averaged uh, a reduction in their drinks by 13 to 34 percent, and that 10 to 20 percent of them, that dropped them down into moderate or safer levels of drinking, and that this impact persisted over time for a lot of people. Most of you, I, I believe, by this point are familiar with the elements of brief inter inter intervention of uh, asking for permission to give feedback, enhancing motivation, providing advice, working with people in terms of uh, negotiating next steps and goals that they have for themselves. And I think the, um, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to highlight on this uh, data on effectiveness is again, as we get into literature, it's sometimes tricky to try and interpret uh, this stuff, but the primary, the brief intervention literature, I think, gives us a very robust um, set of studies showing that if you help people identify that they have a problem and help them to set themselves a goal, that they can, through self-management, change their behavior. You know, how that applies when we get further up the continuum into moderate to severe is, I think, still an open question. But it's, it, I, we have to uh, figure that in these studies, there were a fair number of people who actually had more significant levels of drinking who, who did, did change. Again, the, the main thing about the, the, this uh, data, another important thing about all this data, um, is that it really is a reinforcement on the, the benefits of having a mo motivational approach to this, that, that people change when they believe they have a problem, they think they can be effective in changing and they participate in setting the goals. And I think this, this again, uh, applies whether we're talking about uh, relatively early problems or as we start talking about uh, deciding and figuring out how to abstain or moderating a pattern of use. The other thing about the motivational approach is this idea that it has to be in sync with the person's stage of change if you want to be uh, successful with it, that the person has to have uh, worked through uh, this, some of this contemplation, determination, action. They have to have come uh, to some conclusion about uh, the level of problem they have and whether they want to do something about that and they have to have decided to take action. So again, I think this is gonna be very important when we talk about um, uh, more severe, moderate to severe problems as well. Uh, my favorite quote, if I can get it to come up, from uh, Bill Miller, the, one of the godfathers of motivational interviewing is when your goal is behavior change, the optimal style of interacting is usually guiding. It should feel more like dancing than wrestling. And uh, We'll come back to that later. There we go. So now we're, we've moved along into uh, when we've, our assessment is indicating that this is a more severe level of problems. What are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna intervene? And, and typically the advice has been uh, to abstain, uh, often uh, get as much help as you can, consider using 
medications. We have a lot of uh, literature on evidence-based behavioral treatments that can be very effective. Uh, uh, we've heard about uh, um, contingency management, uh, uh, motivational interviewing, peer support group uh, help. Cognitive behavioral treatment is a, is a mainstay. And as Dr. Grant also said yesterday, we really need to think about cognitive behavioral therapy as uh, a set of techniques that can be adapted to meet the person where they are with their particular kind of problem. It's not a one size fits all. It's a con concept of how do you help people figure this stuff out and decide on and make changes. In terms of medications, you know there are a number of medications that can help us with this process. Uh, just to comment on them a little bit in terms of uh, moderate versus severe. If you look at the data on some of them, obviously disulfiram, where you have to be abstinent or you get sick, uh, but all the data is using that with severe alcohol use disorder with abstinence as an orientation. Now, Trexone, interestingly enough, has a lot of data that shows uh, that almost in some ways it's, it's most appropriate for moderating intake, although it also has clear benefit for folks who are trying to abstain. Camprosate, the data seems to lean more to just using it with severe. Um, there are a number of other non-FDA approved uh, that uh, 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 have suggestion of being helpful, uh, how they play out in terms of, of severe versus moderate, or absence versus moderation. Is a, is a bit more uh, unclear. I like the added benefit of, of some of these medications in serving as a, a tool in assessing ambivalence, sort of a litmus test of ambivalence. If you tell somebody I've got this uh, medicine that you take, and abuse, and if you take it, you cannot drink, you will get sick, you will throw up, you will be in the, could be in the ER. Um, it flushes out ambivalence about uh, wanting to stop drinking fairly clearly sometimes. Again, good. Uh, now, Trexone, of all the medications, probably has the best evidence base. I love Dr. Grant's comment yesterday that it seems to be the pan addiction drug of the moment. It's even showing benefits in a lot of other non uh, chemical behavioral addictions. Uh, it shows uh, not just reducing relapse rates, but frequency and quantity of drinking, a decreased craving, and enhanced abstinence. Uh, one of the co PIs on this was Dr. Garbutt, again, a UNC colleague. Uh, North Carolina has had a, a, some prominence in this whole uh, effort. Uh, there are further studies on naltrexone showing it's, it, it can be, uh, it doesn't have to involve intense counseling, that simple brief management can result in very positive effects, brief, brief med management, uh, and can be very applicable to primary care as well as specialty settings. Okay, so mild to moderate severe alcohol use disorder. What's the same and what's different about intervening. One of the challenges here is that um, most of the studies, a lot of the studies that we have on alcohol use dependency treatment traditionally have been done on middle-aged treatment-seeking adults, especially white males and veterans, with severe alcohol use disorder. Uh, studies are often, or generally, not particularly clear on the levels of severity uh, or attempts to match or tailor treatment to the level of severity. So it's it's a bit hard to generalize to a large majority of problematic drinkers, uh, particularly those with less severe alcohol use disorder, which as we saw from the, from the data is, is the most, they are the more common. So, but there is a growing attention and literature on decreasing at risk or problematic use, including comparisons of absence and non-absence goals and outcomes. So, where can we kind of start with this to get a handle on it? Well, I think if, if most, there's a consensus of most, among most of the documents and most of the authors that, that you review on this, uh, that um, there is a potential for moderation management or a return to low risk drinking, uh, but it tends to be more likely to be successful in patients who have not yet developed a pervasive pattern of alcohol abuse or who have experienced relatively few negative consequences as the severity increases, the likelihood goes down dramatically of being able to reduce drinking to moderate levels and keep it there. Uh, strong family history, poor social support, linked to problematic use, comorbid psychiatric conditions, as we've heard, also likely worsen the chances of success uh, with going back to low-risk drinking. Uh, 
motivational interviewing on the other hand can help patients progress towards change. Uh, there's more and more talk about the importance of, of the uh, clinician helping the patient to set their agenda and acting as a partner and collaborator rather than the person that says, this is what you have to do. It's another variation on avoiding my way or the highway. And then demanding abstinence has this risk of, of driving patients away from treatment. And it, it's, this could be potentially important in terms of harm reduction because we know a lot of people with alcohol uh, dependence do not seek treatment. If you ask them why, a good number of them will say because they don't want to give up drinking entirely. So if you at least offer an, a, an openness to moderation management, it may be a foot in the door. It may be the first part of a step to care approach of increasing intervention and keeping that person in treatment. This has been uh, functionalized in a number of guidelines. These are the, the NICE uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines in the UK, which are also accepted by uh, the German health system. Uh, say, you know, abstinence is the appropriate goal for most people, particularly those with significant problems. Uh, if a, but they say if a user prefers a goal of moderation, advise strongly, but do not refuse treatment. If unwilling to consider a goal of abstinence, consider a harm reduction prog program of care. Uh, for harmful drinking or mild dependence without significant comorbidity, uh, consider moderate drinking, level of drinking as an appropriate therapeutic goal. This is one uh, meta-analysis that was done on a number of studies. There, there, again, there, there's a growing literature on this. This is one a fair example of that, a meta-analysis of looking at using behavioral self-control, which is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy oriented towards uh, moderate drinking. And uh, the meta-analysis showed that it was significantly better than no treatment or alternative treatments. They compared it to some other uh, less specific uh, treatments. Uh, it was significantly better at reducing drinking consumption and problematic drinking. In six of the studies, it was as effective or more effective than abstinence-oriented -orient treatments. So what does this sound like? Uh, when you're in this, when you're in this setting, um, how might how might this actually sound clinically? Well, a conversation might be, uh, where do you think you are on the spectrum? Where are you on this habit compulsion out of control? What are your goals regarding drinking and quality of life? Not just I want to stop drinking. Well, why? What do you want to get back in your life? Do you think you're at a point you need to stop entirely or try again to cut back? Because generally these folks are coming in saying, well, I've been trying and it's not working. What do you think others would say to that? How have you done with managing or cutting back in the past? What help do you need to try and make it succeed this time? If that is your, is your goal, that you're moving towards a collaborative agreement on a therapeutic trial of self-management. The Marty Mann test is a, uh, something that Jane and I both have found very uh, useful over the years. Marty Mann was an early AA member and she would uh, say that the test you wanna know in terms of to find out if you are an alcoholic or not, in her terminology, was I want you every day for the next month to drink one drink a day, no more, no less. Uh, the, the paradox is that, you know, or the irony is that a lot of folks with drinking problems find it easier to not drink at all than they do to manage their drinking. And the person, uh, many people will come back in after a week or two weeks, go and forget about it. There's no way. You know, once I prime the pump, once I'm out of the gate, I'm off and running. And they come back deciding, you know, this moderation thing maybe wasn't such a good idea. Okay, now one of the options, one of the thing, dilemmas you're going to have as a clinician and that I have as a clinician uh, when I'm trying to maintain this or trying to work through this is there are going to be times when I agree with the patient's goal. There are times when I, my clinical judgment doesn't agree. So if I agree, good. I'm, I'm into promoting self-efficacy, providing perspective, providing support. When I don't agree, when I have concerns, I tend to sort of try and stay in the motivational mode. I encourage contemplation. Well, what, what's good about that choice? But what are the risks? What are the challenges? And is it worth that risk? What do you think about the risks that, that, that go along with trying to do this one more time? And sometimes the risks are just, they, they are just too great. They'd love to go back to moderate drinking, 
that there are just some things that say, God, I just can't take that chance. What's the potential response of your family? Pro provide perspective. How did it go last time you tried to cut back? And what would you need to do differently? And can you do that? And then for me, one of the core things is emphasizing safety. And that's, that's the time when I start to sweat about this a bit is, you know, what do you and I need to put in place to make sure you are safe? As we come up with your drinking goals, as we come up with your moderate goals, you know, they obviously have to have things like no drinking and driving, uh, et cetera. Okay. Now, the good news is there, there are a lot of, of guides out there. There's actually a, a, a pretty robust um, uh, set of things online and in the bookstores and, and, and among therapists. Uh, uh, so one of the things you may want to do is find a therapist that's comfortable with the idea of non-abstinence moderation uh, management uh, and feels comfortable applying some of these steps. Most of the time, what counseling involves is this combination of setting goals, building commitment. A lot of them talk about taking a break, 30 days of abstinence to start out with, uh, pinpointing patterns and triggers, plan for and practice managing those triggers, finding rewarding alternatives, practicing feed, practice these things, give yourself feedback, problem solve, practice again. And also, you have to be keeping on the table what are the alternatives, how are we going to know if it's not working, and what are the alternatives. You know, so a lot of times, uh, the, the, some of the first steps are going to be things that you would imagine. First step, obviously, is deciding, moderation or abstinence, focusing on very clear limits. It's not, I'm going to drink less, it's, well, what does that mean? You know, how many drinks per episode, what kind of situations, uh, what do you expect as benefits so that you can uh, measure those benefits and reward yourself, how are you going to monitor, how are you going to monitor daily, and these are some of the things that are different than cognitive behavioral therapy being applied to abstinence orientation, obviously, but this idea of monitoring how much you're drinking uh, and not just uh, identifying triggers, people, places, things, etc., but also when you are drinking, how do you, how do you give yourself a reasonable chance of being able to stick to your uh, therapeutic goals and your limits? Obviously, you have to be measuring. You want to slow down, space out sips, switch to less concentrated. The strategy of putting the drink down, only drink it, don't keep it in your hand. Some fairly straightforward things. Dr. Grant mentioned smoking. Is huge. The idea of having people decide, you know, are you going to keep smoking knowing that's a trigger to drink? Just a quick comment again on naltrexone that, you know, a lot of this is a really interesting meta analysis going back to a bunch of studies that showed in a lot of ways naltrexone actually works better for decreasing heavier excessive drinking than it does on promoting abstinence. You have to be adapt, able to adapt these treatment goals. What if the patient's unable to comply? Uh, what do you need to do differently if they're not able to comply? And revisit the pros and cons of abstinence versus non-abstinence. There are a lot of resources. Um, moderation management is online, and it actually has a pretty good research behind it. The people starting it are pretty good uh, clinician researchers. Uh, there are three books that I would recommend all by very noted people in the field and uh, all uh, very much oriented to helping people self-manage this. And these are good tools to, uh, if you're gonna do some of the counseling or if you're just gonna try and do relatively brief interventions and in bibliotherapy. So interventions across the continuum are needed to reduce the public health risk. Brief intervention is effective for high risk, early problem drinkers, possibly more broadly. MI approach is critical. Medication has evidence of effectiveness. Abstinence continued to be the preferred therapeutic goal with those with severe alcohol use disorder or in the setting of serious comorbidity. But evidence supports consideration of a moderation goal for those who have less severe AUD or as a harm reduction alternative for patients who have that as a goal for themselves. I would finish with two of my favorite quotes from one of my heroes and mentors in the, in the field, George Valiant. Uh, from his book, Natural History of Alcoholism. Alcoholics recover not because we treat them, but because they heal themselves. At a minimum, we should not impede the natural recovery process. Thank you, and good luck with your practice. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, we have a, don't have a lot of time for questions, but there's one that I got um, a, a couple of questions on. They referenced the 2018 Lancet study which 
quote unquote says no level of alcohol consumption improves health and end quote and increased use is linear linearly related to adverse outcomes like cancers so how do you factor that into your moderation approach well it's 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 a it's 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 an interesting question. I appreciate you asking the question because I've I've puzzled over that, um, and I and I haven't probably haven't done the the degree of attention to it that I that I could have. But I um, again, there there is a body of data that demonstrates this alternative assumption that a very minimal amount of you know one to two drinks uh, has some health benefit, and that abstinence does not necessarily is not the the gold standard, um, so I've I've I'll, I'll be frank I've I've struggled with that a little bit, but because I'm, I'm I'm not sure how that equates with the conflicting data that I've seen in in a number of other other studies in terms of what that means in terms of of uh, moderation. Um, again, I think the 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 when I get into talking about that kind of data with patients, it's not always that. Productive. I mean, it still boils down to, you know, what does the person think their relationship is with alcohol, and do they want to give it up entirely? And that that may be a bit more another brick in the wall for them to say no drinking, but usually it has more to do with the consequences in their their own life and what they see in terms of their relationship rather than people think of it. 